So I'm going to start up uh, the recording for everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Secrets of Remote Retrospectives with Esther Derby and David Horowitz. I'm Nikki Kohari, the COO of Retrium, and I'll be helping out with today's call. Before we get started, I want to take care of a, some housekeeping and introduce our speakers. So first, we will be recording this call and sharing it with those that are interested. So if you have colleagues or friends that couldn't make today's session, we'll be sharing that link out soon. And second, we would love your active participation during the webinar. I uh, see already lots of things coming into the chat. Um, if at any point in time you have a question that you would like the presenters to answer, please use the Q&A box at the bottom there in Zoom. Again, um, if you want a question for the presenters that you'd like them to answer at the end, please use the Q&A box and not the chat box, because uh, the chat box just goes fast and furious to everybody and we won't be able to keep up there. And we should have a few minutes at the end to answer all of those questions for you. And now I wanna to introduce today's presenters. Esther Derby. If you are not familiar with, with uh, Esther, you probably don't know too much about retrospectives. Uh, she co-authored the book, Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great. Additionally, she's written over 100 articles, as well as co-authoring the book, Behind Closed Doors, Secrets of Great Management. Esther started her career as a programmer, and over the years, she's worn many hats, including business owner, internal consultant, and manager. From all of those perspectives, one thing became clear. Our level of individual, team, and company success was deeply impacted by our work environment and organizational dynamics. As a result, she has spent the last 25 years helping companies design their environment, culture, and human dynamics for optimum success. Last August, she launched an online class all about retrospectives, and you should definitely check that out. Also on today's call is David Horowitz, and David Horowitz is the CEO and co-founder at Retrium, a software platform that makes it easy to run engaging and effective agile retrospectives. Prior to co-founding Retrium, he spent nearly a decade at the World Bank as a software developer turned agile coach. He is a repeat organizer of both the Retrospective Facilitators Gathering and the World Retrospectives Day, and a frequent speaker on the Agile Conference Circuit. He has a master's degree in technology management from the University of Pennsylvania and the Wharton School of Business. He's married to his college sweetheart and a father of three. Now I'm going to turn it over to Esther to get us started with today's presentation. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, I'm just super happy to see all the people from all over the world who have dialed in for this. And as I said, um, I may have a little bit of barking in the background. It's it's not me. It's my it's my dog. And I'm going to give her a little treat to keep it quiet, but she may bark. So I'm going to ask your forgiveness in advance. Um, I'm super excited to do this um, because I, I hear so many people who are really struggling with remote retrospectives. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share my screen so you can see kind of what the agenda is. Um, yeah, okay, sharing screen. Um, first, I want to talk about what we mean by a remote retrospective. I'm going to share a little bit about the five stage retrospective format, which um, is described in the Agile Retrospectives books, and which I use for most retrospectives, not all of them, but most of them. I'm going to share uh, eight principles for better remote retrospectives, and then we're going to expand on principles seven and eight, which are about making the most of your tools. So, um, what do we mean by remote retrospective? Because I, you know, I ask that question, I get all sorts of different answers. So this is how I'm thinking about it. We're going to take a little poll. Um, some retrospectives, you have a bunch of people face to face, but then you have one or two individuals who are remote and often um, participating via phone line, which is really difficult. Um, sometimes you have people who are face to face, but they're in different locations. Um, and you have a couple of individuals who are in their own um, location. Sometimes you have just a group, groups, various groups that are distributed, and sometimes you have everybody remote. So to me, all of those are remote retrospectives, 
and they all require a different level of thinking about how you're going to design a retrospective so that you can actually have an, an effective event so that people can think, learn, and decide together. And each one of these situations is a little different. So we want to get a sense of where you guys are and what kind of retrospectives you're, you're um, working with. Nikki, were you going to do that poll? So first, the first poll is um, how often you do remote retrospectives. And then we're going to ask you the next question. We've got it going now. Uh, okay. 40, 50 percent of the people voted, 60 percent. Uh, still going, still 68. 69, 70% of folks have voted. Just to give you uh, five more seconds here to finish up with the last votes and they will, will end the poll and share it with everybody. All right, let's go ahead and end it and share the results. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So some of you are doing it all the time and some of you are doing it most of the time and some people are just here to learn some stuff that might be useful for the future. That's great. Okay, so now we'll look at the different flavors of remote. So you have most people in the room, but a couple of people phoning in or dialing in somehow. You have small groups of people in different locations and then some individuals. You have mul multiple sub teams, everybody at different, small groups, but at different locations or every single person's remote. So we had to take another little poll to get some data. All right, we've got the poll up and running. Please share your feedback in there. Which remote setup are you in most often? We've got about 40% of the votes in so far. Give you all a couple more seconds. We get up to 60 or 70 percent of the votes here. And I'll administer another dog treat. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, two more uh, seconds here and we'll go ahead and in the poll and share the results with everyone. Oh, this is this is super interesting. So uh, the biggest category is most people are in the room together and you have a few remote individuals. And I think that's actually the most difficult situation. I think that's the toughest situation you have. Um, when you have uh, multiple groups with a few remote individuals, that's also pretty tough. Um, it's actually easiest if everybody's remote. That's the in terms of remote retrospectives, that's the easiest one to plan for. So um, we'll share some ideas about how to how to um, work with those situations and um, that will come up in the principles. And then if you have specific questions, put them in the Q&A the Q box and we'll, we'll try to get to them. OK, so we know something about who's here. Um, I think I got my poll slides in the wrong order. So I'm gonna share just a, a quick overview of this five-stage retrospective format, which is actually based on how people think clearly together, right? People use this, um, you follow this pattern individually, but when they're together, the, the challenge is to make sure that people are actually processing in the same way at the same time. So you don't have someone who is, um, still examining the data while someone else is is wanting to figure out where to go to action so this this helps people walk through a very natural and normal thought process together so we start by setting the stage which is saying what are we going to focus on then we look at gathering data related to our focus and you can have observable data or sometimes called objective data which is things that can be verified that can be counted that um, there is some way to have have concrete data measurable data um, subjective data has to do with perceptions with opinions with feelings both are completely valid 
And which data is going to be most helpful depends on the, um, the focus of your retrospective. So if you're talking about how do we feel about our, our um, you know, our stand-ups or how do we feel about our planning meetings, then you might use objective data. But if you're looking at your defects, you know, why do we have so many defects? We need to understand what the patterns are, where they're coming from. Then I would want to be using objective data, right? So, so you're actually counting the number of defects and categorizing them in some way rather than just having opinions about them. So once you have data, you can generate some insights. So this, this is looking at what are, what are we seeing in our data? What does it mean for us? But it also means what might we do to understand the problem better and what might, uh, what might we do as a potential action. Once you have potential actions, you can choose which one you're going to do. And I recommend only doing one or two actions at the very most, because otherwise it's, it, it can become overwhelming. And take small actions, because otherwise it's overwhelming. Right? So choose one or two, keep them small, and then close the retrospective to summarize and reflect on your process. And from there, you apply what you've learned. You do some experiments. Um, and you come back for your next, next retrospective. So it's a natural learning cycle. But I find that these, being very clear about these five steps is super helpful to people. Um, so that you're not having a conversation that's going off in all directions. Um, you're not just going on people's individual opinions. You're creating a shared pool of data so people are actually talking about the same thing. Right, super, super important. And it often takes less time than it, uh, took for me to describe it. What I think people get in trouble with a lot is that they jump to generating insights or they jump to deciding what to do. And that means that people are not on the same page. They don't have shared data. They are likely not to coalesce around some action that they all agree would be helpful. So that's the five stage format. Um, and I think it's really easy with remote retrospectives to kind of skip to the brainstorming, particularly, um, you know, if that's where your tool pushes you, but that's not necessarily the right thing to do. So, um, hmm. now I want to share the principles for remote retrospect retrospectives. Um, the first one is designed to equalize participation. Right, so, so when you think about your retrospective, it's easy to think of things to do face to face, but if you're leaving out the people who aren't in the room, they aren't going to fully participate, they aren't going to be fully engaged, they may not feel like they're really valued as a team member. I talked to someone who um, was in a retrospective where uh, the, the person leading it had designed a game for everyone to, to play and said to the people on the phone, well, you'll just have to sit this out. And so they were just sitting there, you know, listening to noise in the room that they couldn't really follow because it was so noisy. So you really have to design to equalize participation. That is the first principle. The second one is structure, structure, structure. You need much more structure when you are um, doing a remote retrospective than when you are doing a face-to-face -face one, where you can kind of get away with doing things on the fly and you can, you know, talk through what to do next or think through what to do next. It's much, much harder when you're doing a remote retrospective. So I think it's really worthwhile thinking about how am I going to structure this retrospective, keeping in mind designing for participation. I think it's useful to send people the structure ahead of time so they can be prepared. That may just be a simple agenda like the one I popped up at the beginning of this. Um, and then let people know where you are in the structure as you go along, right? So that people have some cues about where to move. You know, that we're, 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 we're done collecting data, now we're gonna generate insights. Um, you may not have as great visual cues um, as you do uh, when you're face to face, even with video, sometimes you don't get the cues. Um, if you're on a phone line, it's really even harder, right? So if you have someone on the phone line, I would I would assign them a buddy, so that they can um, they can have someone who can help them get their voice into the room. And your, your visual cues don't have to be really sophisticated. I, mean, I used this one earlier today. Right, 
So you can get a, get people a set of cards so that when they when they need to replace a visual cue, they can do that. I have one that says I have something to say. So you can do that because sometimes it's just hard to break in, particularly if you have um, can't hear you. You know, so it's it's just just replace those cues in whatever you can. Now, if you have people on the phone. Um, that's why I think you should have a buddy so that they have someone who can help them participate. Um, if you're all on the phone, I think that's, I think you need more bandwidth. I think you need much more bandwidth um, to have a, to have a good interaction. Um, so, so uh, I have, I have talked to groups who have protocols for how they mention that they want to bring something in if, if they're just on the phone. They just have a standard set of words that they use. But really, um, if you're trying to do remote work with only a phone line, I think you're, you're really at a disadvantage. And your employer should get you better tools because the tools are much better now. Um, help people remember who's there. Because if you don't have video, um, or if not everybody pops up on the video, you don't know. So it's useful to um, post a list of who's there, maybe with pictures. Um, it's useful to sometimes have assignments about who's going to speak in what order so that people are just really clear who's there, right? Because sometimes um, someone can't be there and people don't know and it's guessing, so make it clear. Actively engage people. Now, it's Harder to do group activities in some cases if you're um, doing a remote retrospective. But if you have people who are in subgroups, evenly divided in subgroups, you can design activities that they can do as a subgroup and then report back, right? If you have a tool such as Zoom where you can do um, team rooms, you can put team, people in team rooms to have pairwise or triad discussions which is often easier for people to uh, express themselves than in you know, a big group situation. So you have to think of ways that you can actively engage people. Use a back channel, because if something is going on with the main tool, people don't have a way to get their voice in, right? So we actually, when we were doing our little test run, we had a problem, and we, so we now have a back channel. We have a back channel set up on WhatsApp, so if anything comes up, I'll get uh, I'll get the little visual notice that something's coming up. So having that back channel is super helpful when anyone is having difficulty participating. Know your tools, right? It's one of the reasons we did a dry run. If you are using a tool for the first time, I think it is is essential that you practice with it and find out everything it can do for you. And don't limit yourself to one tool. Um, we're going to do a little demo in a little bit where we're going to be using um, um, Retrium, which is one tool. But you can use Retrium in con conjunction with Zoom. Um, you can use it in conjunction with screen sharing. You know, so, so don't limit yourself to one tool. Use all the tools you need. And don't let your tools dictate the format. I know there are some um, online tools that kind of, kind of, you know, lean people towards a three-column retrospective, right? You have three columns, you know, what worked, what didn't, what, what do we want to change? And you can do sticky notes, and they kind of push you in that direction. Don't let yourself be pushed, right? Don't let yourself be pushed. You design a retrospective and then figure out how to use your tools to support the interaction and discussion and thinking together that you need to have to have a really great retrospective. Can we ask questions about the principles before we go to the next piece? Can we have, can we do that? Are we allowed? Sure. We certainly, okay. we can, we do have some questions that have uh, come in thus far. So, um, a couple questions that are related to what we've discussed thus far. Um, okay. Olaf asks, does structure, structure, structure imply sticking more staunchly to the phases? How uh, to balance flexibility or mm -hmm. meeting the group's needs with structure? Well, I think, um, I think the structure comes in and that you have to think a lot about how you're going to be orchestrating the, the, the interaction. 
You have to think about that a lot. Um, and obviously, if um, something is going, you know, if, if the energy of the group is just in a completely different um, direction, then yeah, you have to switch. It's harder to switch um, if you have already created a set of online protocols for what you're going to do. I mean, you're going to do sticky notes with, um, you know, with this tool, and you're going to be showing data with this tool. It's harder to shift, right? Um, but it's not impossible, right? And I think I think in Retrium you can actually do some things on the fly. Is that right, David? Yeah. So so depending on the tool you have, you can you can flex. But I think just the fact that people are kind of, you know, they don't have as many cues as they usually have. Um, I think it's super useful, um, super useful to, to, um, to think through ahead of time how you're going to do things, you know, so that people, if they have to go to a particular URL, they know where that is. They have that ahead of time. You're not, you're not fumbling with it. Um, if they need to be looking at certain data, they know where that's going to be. So that kind of thing. Um, should we take another question about principles? Yeah. Uh, regarding the equalized participation principle, which strategy do you recommend to engage team members that are more introverted? Um, Veronica asks, what I've noticed is that despite the tools we must be using, uh, we might be using voices tend to be always the same, leaving those team members uh, without participation. Sure. sure. Well, so, so I always like to have three. So um, you can do um, brainstorming with stickies, that that tends to make it easier for people who are quiet to, to participate. So give them some time to write things down before they speak. I, find, I think pairwise conversations help with that uh, because it's, um, it's more likely that people will be able to talk in a pair and then you report out what the pair talked about. Um, so those are two things. Um, sometimes just doing a round robin, which has, you know, round robins have a certain anchoring effect, but sometimes it is a way to actually get every voice in the room, just to ask everybody to speak or to answer a particular question. Just be aware that anchoring might that might play in there. All righty, sounds good. You want to take a, another question, or should we uh, move on and get some of these at the end? Um, so someone said, does speaking orders interrupt the natural flow of conversation? Yeah, it can, um, but uh, you need to make a choice about um, do when do we need to get every voice in and when can we let the conversation flow and you can always say you know we haven't heard from this group or this subgroup so let's pause and let's hear from them so okay I think I think if we to stay on time I should probably move us on All right. yeah sounds good we'll okay. get the rest at the end thanks Wait. Okay. So, um, as I said, um, you, you need to know your tools, but you can't let your tools dictate how you design your retrospective. So they are there to support you. And we are going to show you a few examples of how we um, used the, um, the, um, what do you call it, David? You know, customized, retro, customized retrospective to actually design um, activities that would work and set the stage, gather data, generate insights um, that, that weren't, you know, we had to think them up and figure out how we were going to do them. So we have some examples for you. And we have a lot of questions. So, are you ready, David? I'm ready, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I was noticing a lot of the questions had to do with how to keep remote team members engaged in the retrospective. And so hopefully, as we do the demo of how to actually use tools, not, not let tools dictate the format, but let the format uh, guide what you're doing in the tool, some of those concerns will be answered as well. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, 
and head on over to Retrium, which some of you might have used before, some perhaps not, some a long time ago when the features are less than they are now, and hopefully we'll show you the five stages uh, in, in Retrium. So the first one, of course, is setting the stage. Now there's a lot of different setting the stage activities, but the one that we thought would be interesting to share would be a safety check. Um, now in Retrium, there is a blue action button on the bottom right that allows you to pick a technique for your retrospective. And there's a lot of pre-built techniques here, a number of team radars that we'll show in a minute. There's some column-based retrospectives. There's also this build your own retrospective format. So I'm gonna click build your own and start the retro. And when I do that, I get a blank screen. But for a safety check, the purpose of a safety check is to get a sense in the room of how safe do the team members currently feel with regards to speaking up about the issues that they're experiencing on the team. Um, and to get a sense of the safety of the team, you'd want to get a rating from one to five from each team member. So what we can do is add five columns, one, two, three, four, and five, and ask everybody in the team to go ahead and cast their vote on one of these five ratings where five would be, I feel completely safe talking about anything. And one is, I don't feel safe talking about much of anything with my teammates or my manager. Um, and instead of asking people to write content into the notes, we just say, just click create a note next to the number that uh, represents how safe they feel. So for example, if I feel very safe, I'd click five. And that has cast my vote. And I'll ask now everybody else on this team to do the same. And this is, you can do this anonymously, right? So right. Which is important in a safety check. And this is an example of any time you want to create a sort of histogram, you can do it this way. So any, any data where you want to get a sort of um, um, a sense of how people are perceiving things, so this would be subjective data, you, and you can do a histogram, you could adapt this method by creating your own five columns and having people vote anonymously in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so right now we have four people on the team who've all put their anonymous cards underneath one of these columns. The anonymity is a really important point, Esther, I think, because this is actually better in some ways than in person, where in person it can be a bit more tricky from time to time to be truly mm -hmm. anonymous. Um, here, the colors of the notes don't correspond to anything. They're completely randomized. And so we're getting a histogram view of how safe the team feels. And this team happens to be pretty safe. So we have two fives, one four, and one three. Of course, it's possible that we'd get a lot of ones. And if that were to happen, Esther, what would you recommend doing at that point? Um, then I would shift to doing, um, I would shift to doing a ground rules exercise where we talk about what could we do to make it safer. Because mm -hmm. um, what people bring up in ground rules is very often what they're afraid of. And um, so I could use stickies to do that you know, have people generate several ideas about what they wanted to do to make things uh, more right. safe for them. And I might then not push things as far if people don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so creating another custom retrospective uh, where you might say, what are you feeling unsafe about? Again, it's completely anonymous. And yep. so you don't have to identify yourself as the creator of a note, but that would be a great flow yeah. that it's not the tool dictating where you're going, it's you on the fly coming up with a structure based on what you're seeing uh, that helps reinforce good practices and good conversation on the team. So, all right, right, let's. we've done the safety check and this team's pretty safe. So let's move on to the next phase of the retrospective. I'm gonna end this one. And now we wanna move to gathering data. So there's objective data and subjective data, as Esther mentioned. Um, at this point, if you wanted to gather objective data, you could easily share your screen to show um, things like, um, I don't know, your burn down chart, for example, or if you've had some commits into a repository, you could show a timeline view of the commits and just share your screen with the team so that they can see it. Again, that's not in the tool, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, for the purposes of- You should uh, do it. Yes, you absolutely should do it. Be more strong than that, you're right. There's subjective data that you can gather as well. Um, so a team radar is a great way of gathering subjective data. So I'm gonna show how that would work. There's a number of pre-built team radars on, on Retrium. One of them is the Scrum Ceremonies radar. So let's do that one today. 
Now, the way the radar works is it presents a number of different aspects of your work. In this case, the different ceremonies or events that Scrum defines, sprint planning, daily stand-up, sprint review, backlog refinement, and the retrospective. And you can ask everybody on the team to rate themselves from one to five on how they think the team's doing in that aspect of their work. So let's, everyone on this team, let's go ahead and start casting our votes on the different spokes on this radar. Now you'll notice as everyone is doing that, uh, for example, Jason over here is casting his votes. Now I can't see what he's voting on right now. I don't see it appearing on the radar, but I do see that he's voting. And you can see that over here in these dots disappearing, which helps you as a facilitator know the engagement level in the room. Um, I'm gonna start casting my votes as well. Uh, so let's see, let's say sprint planning's a four, um, perhaps the daily standup's going really well, the sprint review is eh, backlog refinement in the middle, and maybe the retrospective we're doing, let's say a four. Um, and so that's my personal radar on how I think the team's doing. Now to see everyone else's results, I'm gonna to go to the analysis phase of the retrospective. And what you'll see here are lines representing in an anonymous way, again, everybody's radars and how they think the team is performing. Um, and if I wanted to, for example, get a sense of, on average, how well is the team doing in these different ceremonies, um, you can click the average button on the legend or move to the next explore results box up here. And you'll see that we're doing great at daily standup. The average rating is a 4.0. Backlog refine it, it's pretty good. Um, all the way down to the retrospective, which this team is not doing well at all. They have a 1.8. So Esther, when we find out that the average is pretty low on a, a certain topic, um, what do you do with that? What's the next thing you do as a facilitator? Well, that's where I might focus my time, right? So uh, in this case, it's, um, it's not terrific there, so I might want to get some information about, um, well, there is at least one person who thinks they're working well, so I want to know what is working that we want to keep and what would make it more valuable? Mm -hmm. What would make it more valuable? So again, we're not letting the tool dictate the process. We've discovered right. data here, and we're going to adapt our retrospective based on what we've seen. Before we move to uh, that, the next phase, based on what Esther just mentioned as what's working right now, what's valuable, and what can we do to make them more valuable, I do want to show that there's other things you can see on this diagram as well that are really interesting, and only a tool can provide this. Again, there's some advantages to remote teams and remote retrospectives, where here we're seeing the normal distribution and the average, so you can see how much agreement there is on the team and how much disagreement there is on the team, or even better, um, you could see uh, the standard deviation around that as well. So you can see, are there, is there agreement uh, and how much for each one of these spokes? So there's some interesting statistics that you can see and dive into. But we're gonna go and dive into retrospectives as a topic. Um, just to back up for a moment, there's two different types of retrospectives that you can run at a high level. The first is a, a broad-based retrospective where you're not really having a narrow focus, you're having a focus on whatever people want to talk about, um, very open-ended. And the second one is when you really want to dive into a narrow focus. And that's what we're doing here. We're saying, okay, we're putting everything else aside, even if there's room for improvement on sprint planning and on sprint review and so on, we're just gonna narrowly focus on retrospectives from here on out in this retrospective. All right, so let's end this. And now we know we're focusing on retrospectives for the remainder of this retrospective. It's a very meta retrospective, Esther. <laughs> um, and we wanna dive in. So let's do another build your own template. Start the retro. And I'm gonna add a column here and type in what is valuable currently, right now, oops, about our retros. And another one that says, what would make our retros more valuable? So again, I didn't come into this with ideas uh, about what this would look like. I'm basing this on what we've discovered in the retrospective itself. So I'm gonna ask everybody on the team to just start writing some ideas onto the screen. And I will point out that I used my back channel to tell you that I am not in the team, so. So we have a WhatsApp group going. So Esther, yes, let us know she's so having some trouble getting in and there you go. Way of communicating. Um, now you notice a couple of things going on here. First of all, some notes are being created on the screen, but they're blurred out. I can't see 
what people are typing. That's actually really powerful because uh, Esther mentioned the anchoring effect in a round robin discussion. So this helps overcome that. You don't know what other people are typing in, you just know that they're participating. And there's a, a bit of positive peer pressure going on there where you see everyone else on the team's contributing, so maybe I should write something in here too, which addresses another point that was coming up in the Q&A a lot around um, uh, getting engagement on remote teams and retrospectives. So if you are have low engagement, maybe because of introversion or because of uh, maybe there's an outgoing person who dominates the conversation, creating sticky notes that are fully anonymous uh, are a great way to encourage people to participate in the retro without even having to speak up. I'm going to create a note here uh, myself. So what's valuable currently about our retros, um, maybe uh, we actually changed a few things last time after the retro was over. Yay. So that's what's working for me. So and the key thing here is that that you know you can customize what you're gathering, you know, with this tool or other tools, um, so that you're not just going in lockstep with with um, some predetermined formula of the tool that you can actually um, think about and um, of what's going in the room and what you plan for. So I think all of that, I think, does this respond to your question about, uh, you know, if the energy goes in a different way, what do you do? All right, so it looks like there's some notes on the screen. Um, so let's move on now and reveal those notes because right now they're all blurred out. So this is the moment of truth. A lot of times when I've facilitated remote retros, there's a bit of nervous laughter right now because you type something in and up till now it was hidden and all of a sudden, boom, it's available. So usually there's some nervous laughter, that's okay. Um, everything is now visible. And likely there'll be some overlap in the content on the notes because we had a shared experience over the past two weeks in our sprint. So um, maybe there's some overlap here. Of course, this is just a demo, so there also might not be in our case. Um, action plan is clean. Uh, I can share my thoughts anonymously. Maybe that combined with getting the product owner involved is a good one. That's about engagement um, in the retro. Um, so you can create a group to affinity theme or affinity map these notes mm -hmm. together. When that's done, uh, you'd move along to the dot voting phase. And the dot voting phase is there to enable the participants in the retro to express their preference about the most important thing to discuss in the retrospective. Um, a lot of times, I guess, especially in round robin conversations and open-ended conversations, people just talk about whatever comes to mind first. And of course, engagement is low if we're talking about things that don't actually matter to people on the team. Mm -hmm. So dot voting helps us prioritize topics of conversation. Um, and I think it's important that you said it's a preference. So, so um, there's a difference between a preference and an evaluation. And there are times when expressing a preference is perfectly appropriate. Mm -hmm. And again, this is fully anonymous. So I could vote on a topic that's pretty unpopular, but it will never be tied back to me. So I'm gonna ask everybody in the retro to start voting. And you'll see over here on the left-hand side of the screen, um, votes start to disappear as people vote, but you won't be able to see what people are voting on. So again, you don't know uh, what the votes are before you cast your own. I'll wait for Fred to finish voting. It looks like he's almost done. And there he's done. And now I'm going to move on to the next phase of the retrospective, which of course is discussion. So we have this wonderful topic, engagement in the retro was voted up the most. It got five dot votes from across the team. So now we have a topic that people are interested in. And again, going back to low engagement in retrospectives, if engagement is low, one thing you really want to make sure you're doing is talking about something that matters to the team. And this was a great way of dialing in first on a big subject that matters, retrospectives, because we had a low rating in the radar, and then more finely tuning that to pick a topic within the concept of retrospectives that people really care about. Um, Esther, now that we have a topic, what would you do next in the retrospective? Well, it I think it depends on what tools you have available. I mean, if you have a uh, set up like a Zoom meeting where you can have um, you you can have small group conversations, you can send people off to you know their little virtual team room and two or three people they could have a small discussion and then come back and report back in terms of their ideas about how you could improve it. 
um, you could do another round of stickies to say, okay, so um, what can we do to improve this problem? Or you could say, what do we think the source of this problem is? I mean, you could go either way um, using stickies to gather some more data, or if you have a capability like a, a, a team room, a virtual team room, you can have small group discussion and come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of having the small breakout discussions between mm -hmm. multiple people. Zoom does let you do that. Um, and then maybe even after that, coming back to gather more sticky notes around um, insights around why this is happening. And eventually, when we're ready, of course, to brainstorm actions that we can take. Um, but we always want to delay that till the last responsible moment because people have a tendency to discuss mm -hmm. actions before they really know what is going on. And that's... Yeah. Yeah. Which is why we have the five-phase retrospective in the first place, right. so that people don't jump into action before they've actually considered it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing you could do uh, is, at this point, end the retrospective. Now we know we're talking about engagement in the retro in these particular notes, and ask everyone to start writing down possible actions, uh, mm -hmm. if we were ready for that. Um, and again, you could go through this whole process once more of brainstorming privately and an anonymous way affinity theming and dot voting to come up with where's the energy in the room around what action we want to take yeah. at this point, rather than skipping right now to, okay, we're going to commit to 10 actions to fix this because let's face it, then nothing will, nothing will happen. Right. Yeah. That's my reaction as well. Uh, it's hard enough as people to fix anything in life to right. change anything, let alone 10 things. So focus really narrow in on just one. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's say we've done that. I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole process again, but uh, it gives us a nice overview of how you might take it from here. We still are missing one thing, which is um, closing the retrospective. So one, there's a lot of ways of cl closing the retro, but one of Esther, my favorite ways is, is to collect feedback in some way on how the retrospective itself went. Because let's face it, if people are not engaged in the retrospective that you're currently in, and you don't ask for feedback, and then you do it again, mm -hmm then again, they will be disengaged. So it's important to collect feedback to get a sense of, what did I do well? What did I not do well? How can we improve going forward? Um, one great way of that is um, what's called roti, Esther? Yes. So tell us about roti. The tasty Indian bread. Yeah, um, it is. But it also stands for return on time invested. So if you have, uh, you know, if you're at the low end of the scale, this is like, you got nothing out of the time you invested. If you break even, that's kind of in the middle of the scale. You know, I put in I put in an hour in this retrospective, and I got an hour of value out of it. Or at the top end, you know, I got a lot more value than the time I invested. This is going to save me some some work. I understand something more clearly. Whatever it is that um, you feel like you you really got value out of this, and then you follow up by asking, you know, what would make it more value, what valuable, and what made it made it valuable for you. Which, you know, is, is the first one's another histogram, the actually getting the row T numbers is a histogram, and then you follow up with stickies, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. go ahead. No, it's an important step that so many teams I've talked to just skip, because mm -hmm. they come up with actions, and then they say, okay, we call it a day, and let's go home. And again, not getting feedback, not checking out at the end of the retrospective is a, is a big mistake. Um, yeah. So again, this is a histogram for return on time invested. Was this valuable and helpful to you? Was this experience valuable and helpful? If we get all fives, that's fantastic. But in a lot of ways, I actually prefer it when it's a bit lower so you can actually get feedback on, the, on how the team did. Well, even if it's all fives, you can find out what made it valuable to people. So you can amplify that in the future. Yeah. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how tools can certainly help solve some problems. Um, anonymity is a good thing. Sticky notes are a good thing that tools can help you do. Um, even the flow of the retrospective from uh, brainstorming to grouping to dot voting is an effective flow. The team radar is there. But they also, if you don't use them to fit the process you want, can detract from the retrospective itself. And so it's important not to just limit yourselves to what a tool can provide, but to think, how do I want to run this retrospective and then adapt the tool to fit the needs of the facilitation? Yeah. yeah and and you know, there are a lot of tools out there. I mean, I personally like Retrium, but there's a lot of tools out there. So, um, you know, take advantage of all the tools you have access to. Um, I know people who are doing really interesting remote retrospectives with, with Google, you know, using Google, Google Slides and um, some Google Draw and some things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
but just don't let your tool determine how you do your retrospective. Um, have, a, have a solid um, frame and a solid flow that will help the team think, learn, and decide together. And then, you know, apply these principles so that you can, you can really have the best retrospective you can, even when you're remote. Um, I saw one of the comments floating by in the chat was that uh, in a situation where you have um, most of the people face-to-face -face and um, a couple people who are dialing in, that in some ways having everybody re be remote is giving you a mu much more equal participation. So it's something to consider. Great. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Esther? Should we move to Q and A? I think we might do Q and A now. Yeah. What do you guys think? I'm excited. Sounds good. There are a ton of questions. Um, we're probably <laughs> not going to get to all of these. We have had great participation and lots of people um, in the chat. So I'll just pick out a few. Um, at what point in the retro do you check the actions that you took in previous retros? You know, I go. Um, I, I am, am of two minds on that. I mean, sometimes you can do it during set the stage, just do a quick check in, you know, so how did we do on our last actions? But if I, if I work with a team that has uh, a pattern of not being able to follow through, then I might do a retrospective on why we aren't following through on our retrospective items. Because it could be they're too big. It could be we're choosing stuff that we have no control over. Um, it could be that we are so slammed with other work that we can't possibly um, think about improving. So if it's a pattern, I might do a retrospective just to, to get beneath the surface on that. And I, I personally think that uh, teams should have enough slack so that they have time to think and learn, that they're not always booked up to their capacity because you can't be agile when you're booked to your capacity. You just can't be. You have no time to respond. The other thing I'd add to that is sometimes it's good to stop the sprint in the middle of the sprint if you're not completing your action items or at least do a check-in to see why. Yeah. Because yeah. if they're important enough and the productivity is going down or there's some major communication issue, don't wait for the end of the sprint. You yeah. can talk about Absolutely. that in the stand-up or any other time and you can actually retrospect then in the middle. There's no rule that says you have to wait for the end of the sprint for this to happen. Great. Um, another question um, asked early on in the process from Thomas, remote retros often involve different cultures. Any yeah. takes or ideas on that? Well, I think, um, I think one important thing that often comes up is um, the, the uh, speed with which people can respond in their non-native language. Right, so in that case, doing some writing with stickies or something that allows people to gather their thoughts before they have to, you know, put them out there, I think is super helpful. Um, I think that can also help when there's a power difference, right? And people are, you know, in some cultures, very happy to speak up. And in some cultures, they're very, you know, they're more deferential to people who have power. Um, so, so sometimes that anonymity can help there. Um, I might also think about who's in the room, right? That might be um, making it more difficult for people to, to participate. So, I mean, that's a, it's a super big topic. And I think you can't forget that those differences are there. Um, and you, you do what you, what you can to, um, to help people participate. Um, you know, so for some people, criticizing the group feels really awful. You know, it's, it feels disrespectful or bringing up any complaints. So in that case, um, you can sometimes make it an expectation, like, well, I'll be really disappointed if you don't tell me what's not working. In which case, that gives people a little chance to, um, to it gives permission to, to be a little more critical. So it, it depends a lot on what the culture is. Those are a few ideas that I've used in different situations. Yeah, the culture is tricky. Um, mm -hmm. Culture is fun, and it's tricky at the same time. Um, I've had experience working with teams that were in India, Europe, and the US, all mixed together. And obviously, there's quite a bit of difference between all those cultures. So 
one thing that I found to be the case is that while that is true, there are differences between the cultures, teams tend to coalesce around certain norms when they are performing well together or when they really take the time to get to know each other. The cultural differences are still there. It's not to um, say that they go away. They're absolutely still there. But if you take time to actually get to know each other, maybe that's flying to one spot and spending a week doing nothing but hanging out, not doing work together. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, spending time, even though you're remote, having lunch together. This is something that shocks mm -hmm. people when I mention this sometimes in my yeah. talks. But uh, there's no reason why if I'm going to grab a sandwich here uh, near Washington, D.C., where I live, and someone else is uh, in Europe, it might be different times. It might be breakfast for one person and lunch for someone else or dinner. And But usually you can grab a bite to eat together anyway and eat together over video. And don't talk about work. Just have lunch together, right? Or have yeah. coffee together. And that can help overcome some of the cultural nor uh, differences as well. I, I like to have a non-work um, back channel for teams where they can just, you know, um, you know, whatever fall to roll they want to talk about. I, I find that super useful for, for people um, getting to know each other and building some kind, kind of camaraderie that extends beyond the tasks that we're doing. And that's super important for real collaboration. So yeah. um, if you yeah. wait to the retro to try to dig into culture issues, yeah. it's too yeah. late. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so just create whatever um, back channel you can for informal communication. Um, I did that with one one group, and they called it the, the what did they call it the coconut telegraph or something like that. Um, so so it started with a, you know just as a channel, and then they gave it a silly name, which was in some ways a sign that they were developing some camaraderie. And they talked about beer, and they talked about what they were doing, and they talked about a bunch of stuff. But they got to know each other, right? And that was across across several cultures. Great. Um, I have to ask this question because it comes up a lot. What if the team often generates data that blames the PO or other teams rather than their own? Any thoughts on that? I think it depends a lot on how you frame the questions. Right. So I would frame questions that are about uh, how how can we work with what we have or how can we improve relationships? Um, rather than just letting people, you know, spew out blame. Um, and I also generally try to have people work on stuff they can either control or influence, right? So you can control your response to another group, even if you can't change that group. But I, I start by how I phrase the questions. And I might make it clear if that's a if that's a habit in a retrospective that you know we're we're not uh, we're going to talk about our own experience we're not here to criticize other people. There's a great two by two matrix that I've used sometimes, which is just mm -hmm. mapping um, impact high low. So if we're going to take a concern mm -hmm. or an action, how how much of an impact would it have? And the second axis would be in our control versus out of our control. And so you can map these things, and if criticism of a particular individual or some issue outside of our control and another team keeps popping up, you'll see that visually. And I find that the more visualizations that you have, the better off you are in gaining a common understanding of amongst the team. So if it keeps coming up, the advantage of having that visualization and saving it is you can point to it and say, look, you know, it's come up many times and we know it has impact, but it's out of our control. Let's try to refocus on things that are more under our control. Uh, and that can be a great way of circumventing that issue. Or you can change how you respond. Mm -hmm. Right. So if someone's always, uh, you know, adding something mid sprint, you don't, you, you change how you respond to that. And you say, instead of saying, well, okay, we'll take it. You say, yes, we can work on this. What should we take off? Right. So there's a lot of ways you can handle that. But yeah, once things go to blame and complaining, then it's um, then it's not doing any anyone much good. However, I have on occasion done this thing where I just I let everybody write down all their complaints, and they can write down their criticism and their complaints and what they don't like, and then we put them all in a bag or a hat or a box and we pull them out, and I start reading, reading, and then after like five people are like, okay, that's enough. That's enough. You know, we've complained enough. We're ready to move on. So there's lots of things you can do. 
Awesome. Um, how about in remote retros, do you encourage the scrum masters to participate as well as facilitate? I think it's really tough to be a both a participant and a facilitator. Um, I think, you know, what we've been doing in this, um, our little experiment here, it's taking a, an extra person to kind of manage the questions and manage the chat and manage the polls and do all of that kind of stuff. So, so I think it's, uh, I think it's always difficult and I think it's even more difficult when you're doing it remote. If there's a topic you really need to be involved in, then get one of your buddies to facilitate for you so you can fully participate. Cause I think it's hard to do both and, and it's confusing to people if you keep switching roles. It's like, are you being our scrum master now? Or are you facilitating now? I was in one retrospective where someone was facilitating and then at the end said, I'm going to take off, I'm going to put on my manager hat now and tell you what to do. So that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can rotate the role of the facilitator so that, because the scrum master is part of the team, right? So it's important that he or she has the opportunity to provide feedback in the retrospective just as much as anyone else on the team. And there's no rule that says the scrum master has to be the facilitator. So you can rotate that role so that from time to time across retrospectives, today it's me as the scrum master, tomorrow it's Esther and I'll participate uh, and that can help. The other option is you can create a circle of retrospective facilitators across the company so yeah. that you have people who are outside of your team coming in to facilitate your retrospective. There's a lot of nuance and caution there because having someone outside of the team be in the team's retrospective can create issues around psychological safety, but that's a webinar for another day. So leave it at that. Just be cautious if you have an external facilitator, though it can also have a tremendous value there as well. Yeah. And there's kind of the added thing that if you, if, if you know you're going to be facilitating in, in the two or three iterations, you might be more inclined to be nice to the person who's facilitating today. Empathy. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that works. All right, let's do one last question and then we'll uh, wrap things up here. So, um, Can I have a question first. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Are we, are we, are we going to be able to print out these questions in the chat so that, you know, I have the possibility of responding to some of them or you guys can respond to them later? Good question. I don't actually know what happens to this, so we will we'll find out. Um, I'm I'm hoping the answer to that is yes. Uh, we definitely would like to do that. Great information in these. Yeah, yeah. There's a ton of great information. There's I was able to write very very small responses, very quick responses to a couple people. Um, so apologize for the brevity there. Um, and a lot of people had questions specific to Retrium. And if you would like to get those answered today, they, they can reach out to support at Retrium.com and I will definitely get you a response um, specific to the tool as quickly as possible and with a little bit more detail than the fast responses um, that I've given so far. Um, so yes, we hope to get all of the um, responses out to folks. Um, one other point of order too, um, Esther, would you be open to sharing the slides that you created with the folks here? They are very sure. interested sure. <laughs> in the slides. I've gotten several questions about that too. All five of them. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Um, let's wrap up with one last question before we finish today. Um, Esther, would you agree that more people, the more people we have in a retro, the more structured, uh, the more structure is needed. For example, do you really need all retro stages that you talked about for a team of three to five, or can you just have a free flowing conversation to get to the bottom of the most important issues? Well, there's a couple questions in there and I yeah. would say, um, yes, the more, um, the more people you have, the more structure you need. I would say that is true. And I would say that in my experience, when a team is first learning to have this, it super duper helps to have, to follow this structure. And um, even when teams are working well together, I find that they are very often, often subconsciously following this structure. So they have a focus, they look at data, then they generate some insights and then they decide what to do, right? So, so it may feel much more free flowing, but that's generally the arc of what's going on. So, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've had worked with teams who are very uh, free flowing and easy in how they do the retrospectives, but generally they got there by, um, 
having some structure that helped them learn how to, how to have these kind of conversations. Great. Well, I appreciate again all of the questions today. Yeah, Thanks everyone for your awesome participation and um, hopefully we'll be able to reach out with uh, to folks based on the questions that we've got yes. today. Um, if you all are interested in getting a question answered, feel free to reach out to support at retrium.com and we will have the slides and the video available as well um, relatively soon after we get all of this wrapped up. And thanks again, everyone. Well, I want to say one more thing. Yes, go ahead. Which yes. is that um, if you look at the slide that's up on the screen now, there's a there's a discount code for my um, my online retrospectives class if you're interested in that. And if you have any questions that you want to run by me, feel free to email me, esther at estherderby.com, and I'll do my best. And we, we've taken Esther's class. Obviously, we love retrospectives and highly recommend it. So definitely check that out, everyone. And check out Retrium too, and other tools, right? Use everything you can. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks. It's yeah. been fun. Bye bye. Bye, thanks.